about politics more generally. Okay. I just alternate my answers. What was that I just alternate my answers. <laughs> On the ballot. Yes, no, yes, no. Eric goes to every other one, right? <laughs> Don't so. do that. All right, so we're going to watch this video right here. Welcome to the problem of first time for the first time explained by Nancy Gray. The royal family has a problem, but this isn't just any royal family. These are alliances, rulers of the jungle, and time and the <laughs> There are protests over the monarchies after the power and the citizens of the test question. want to say how they are governed. That means the pressure line has advocated the crown and the king used to be an elected office. To ensure a smooth transition, and because she is crankier than her husband, the Queen Line has been remaining on the throne with the power to set the rules for all elections in her kingdom. She has declared that all citizens get one and only one vote, and that the candidate with the most votes wins the crown. This method of voting is most often called first past the post, often the abbreviated as FPCP or winner take all. The system is simple, fair, and logical, right? Actually, no. It's a terrible, terrible idea. Why? Well, see the problems with first past votes. Let's watch the first election unfold in the animal kingdom. It's an exciting time for burgeoning democracy, and seven hopeful candidates come forward to run and represent their parties. They put on their best campaigns, citizens head out to the polls, the votes are counted. The results come in as follows Turtle gets 9% of the vote, Monkey gets 18, Gorilla gets 19, Owl gets 13, Lever gets 20, Tiger gets 15, and Snake gets 6. Under the rules of first past the post, Lever is crowned the winner, and she gets to rule for the length of her turn. But take a look at the results, and you'll see the first problem with this system, minority rule. The vast majority of citizens, 80%, on someone else's game, but Leopard still won. There are only seven candidates in this race, but if you imagine that there had been 20, she might have only gotten 5% of the vote, but still been elected. This problem of minority rule is only the beginning. The second problem of first past the post is that, given enough time, it results in an inevitable, unavoidable two-party system. Why? To see, let's watch what happens over several election cycles. Leopard has had her term in office, and it's again election time in the known democracy. Only now, all the citizens of Animal Kingdom remember the results from last time. This information changes how they behave, particularly Snake and Turtle Leopard, who must face the reality that they back unappealing extremist candidates who don't have a chance of winning. Turtle voters, who are unhappy with their Leopard rule, decide to back the candidate who has the best chance of winning, Gorilla. Now, Snake voters want to vote for Tiger, who is a candidate they have the most in common with, but they're afraid to because Leopard is running a negative campaign against their competitors. Snake voters, not liking the idea of the rule, will vote strategically for Leopard. The final result looks like this, with Leopard getting 26% of the vote and Gorilla getting 28, making him the new king. Snake and Turtle, seeing their dismal results and knowing the cost of their campaigns, decide to drop out of future races. What started out as a seven party system is now down to five. Fast forward to the next election. Only five candidates run, and again, the voters remember what happened last time. In this election, it's our voters who recognize that candidate is not their favorite. They are centrist voters and less ideological than the rest of them. As such, they don't really like Gorilla or Leopard. Both Gorilla and Leopard know this, so they each run negative campaigns to capitalize on the fears of the centrists. Owl voters split their vote and are mostly voting against the candidate they dislike rather than supporting the candidate they do like. After this election, Gorilla gets 33% of the vote and Leopard gets 34, making her the winner. Owl, as did the turtle and snake before her, drops out of the race. In the last election we'll look at, Monkey and Tiger voters are unhappy. They both really like the candidate they have supported, but they now have to compromise. Monkey voters agree with Gorilla on a few issues, but they really don't like Leopard. And Tiger voters agree with Leopard on some issues, but they really don't like Gorilla. They strategically abandon their preferred candidate out of fear of the one they disagree with the most becoming king. The final results are Leopard 49% and Gorilla 51, with him being crowned king. Monkey and Tiger are the last candidates to drop out, and now the animal kingdom is left with a two party system. Because of the centrist and swayable animal voters, in future elections, Leopard might take the crown, then Gorilla wins it back, and then he loses to Leopard again, but the two parties never change. The citizens of Animal Kingdom ended up in the system, not because they are lazy voters or because that's what they really wanted, but because of the mathematics of how the system is set up. Inevitably, given enough time, all first past the post systems trend towards two main parties. But the choice of the voters still hasn't changed since that first election. Only two fifths of them wanted either Leopard or Gorilla as their first choice, and three fifths of them wanted someone else as their first choice. It's this majority of voters that becomes disinterested in the democratic process because they feel they have no meaningful way to express their real preferences. But it only gets worse from here. If the citizens of Animal Kingdom are divided into groups before they vote, they are susceptible to gerrymandering. Gerrymandering is a bit tricky, but imagine a block of 10 homes, each with one voter inside. Three are Leopard voters, three are Gorilla voters, and four are Owl voters. If they're divided up into groups before they vote, whoever 
decide where the lines are drawn has enormous influence over who wins the election. For example, if you group the three member voters with the two owl voters and do the same with the three gorilla voters, you can eliminate owl from the election, even though owl voters are the largest minority and would win under a straight first cast of those votes. If the member of the rural parties are in charge when the voting boundaries are drawn, they have enormous incentive to carve out safe seats for themselves. But more on gerrymandering in another detail. Bah, I hear you say, vote third party and change the system. This brings us to the final and possibly worst problem of first pass of votes, the spoiler effects. Imagine now that it's been years and years of guerrilla or leopard rule. Tiger decides it's time to enter the race. He thinks that the voters are tired of the status quo and he has a shot at winning. He sets up his campaign office, gets a surprising amount of gold and donations, and gets on the Animal News Network to debate with the main candidates. Election night comes around, but alas, Tiger gets only 15% of the vote, mostly from leopard voters who are closest to him on the political spectrum. Gorilla easily beats leopard and gets to be king. This is the first pass the post system at its worst. The better a third party candidate does, the more it hurts its own voters by guaranteeing the loss of the party they most agree with and a win for the party they most disagree with. And don't forget, Gorilla is no fool. He knows how the system works. Where do you think some of those gold donations came from? Meanwhile, the Queen Lioness is displeased. She's been observing the elections and sees that the system is bad for her subjects. And she's been thinking, what makes a good voting system? Well, you should be able to vote for the candidate who you would like the most without worrying. More choice and representatives is better. The system shouldn't be susceptible to gerrymandering, and it should be open to new political parties. Luckily for the Queen, there are several different voting systems to choose from, including the alternative vote. But that will have to be discussed in detail at another time. Thank you very much for watching. Welcome to the problem of first pass of post voting explained by me, C.B. Cooper. Sorry. The royal family has a problem, but this isn't just any royal family. These are the lions, rulers of the jungle since time immemorial. There are protests over the monarchies after the power and the citizens of the animal kingdom want to say how they are governed. Then, due to the pressure, Lion has abdicated the crown and King is to be in elected office. To ensure a smooth transition, and because she is crankier than her husband, the Queen Lioness remains on the throne, power to set the rules for all elections in the animal kingdom. She has declared, to do that, 
Um, and the allocation rules vary by state. There's also sometimes states just out of nowhere, the state party does something weird. And this is a perfect example in 2008 in Texas, they did something super weird. They had a primary system and they said, hey, let's do both a primary and a caucus. And so they did all these caucuses at the same time they were doing primaries. And this really helped out President Obama because his team was like, hey, look, we can get on the ground in these caucuses as opposed to primaries, and we can sway people toward President Obama. And super effective. Hillary Clinton's campaign did not have a ground game in Texas that way. They had this kind of larger campaign that appeals to primary voters, people who go in and vote, you know, uh, in a secret ballot as opposed to a room. And let's talk about that really quickly. So in a primary election, you're going to go in, it's going to be a secret ballot, you're going to sign in, and you're going to vote for someone in your party to be the nominee, okay? In Oklahoma, it's a partially closed system. If you're an independent or a Democrat, you can vote in the Democratic primary. If you're a Republican, you can vote in the Republican primary. So it's closed to Democrats and independents, and the Democratic primary is closed to Republicans. Okay? But it's a, a kind of modified closed system that allows independents an opportunity to vote in one party, not both, because the parties get to decide. Okay? Why would Democrats in Oklahoma want independents to vote in the primary? Mm -hmm. Any ideas? Eric has an idea. Are you going to help? Republicans have more registered voters than Democrats do. Okay. And because of that, um, because they have more registered voters than Democrats do, if Democrats add in the independents, then they actually have more, right? Hmm. And these independents, the thing about voting is if you vote for somebody once, you want to vote for them again, right? And so if you get that opportunity to vote for them, you're more likely to feel connected to them and vote for them again, okay? Because we like winners. Yeah. All right. If you look at the polls, if you look at the signs that are out, what you will find is a more indication of support for a particular candidate is going to inflate their vote. Okay. The more media coverage they get, um, the more the polls indicate their head, the more likely they're going to get a larger share of the vote than they would have had everybody voted. Because people don't like to support what? Losers. Losers, right? This is why we do not go to Oklahoma State, right? We've got many choices. And so um, we don't, they don't like to support losers, right? They like to support winners. And so they vote for who they think is going to win. A lot of times, not everybody. Some people are like, I love this, this is where I am. And I, Care about politics, all of you guys, of course. You have made logical decisions about who you're going to vote for. I'm telling you about your, your friends and your crazy Uncle Ted, okay? They are going to say, oh, there seems to be a lot of support for Joy Hoffmeister, right? I look around and I see lots of signs for Joy Hoffmeister. I can vote for her, right? Because I won't be by myself and I'll be on the winning side. Okay, people get brought along that way. Yeah, Eric? There's more Republicans in Oklahoma than there are Democrats, Independents, and Libertarians combined. Look at that. So more Republicans than there are Democrats, Libertarians, and Independents combined. So I was wrong about that. As of uh, September. As of September. Okay. Yes. Two years ago, that was not the case. So yep. Republicans have a in Oklahoma. All right. But the way that these are set up, Right, it means that this weird caucus system that Texas had at this time, we end up with Clinton getting more votes, right? She gets tons more votes in the primary, but because of the caucus hybrid, instead of she gets her getting 99 to 94, the proportional, a little bit more Texas, she actually only gets 50 votes and President Obama gets 143. 
in 2008. Because of the way the system was structured, does the structure of the system matter? The answer is yes. yes. So if I were to ask, you know, a true or false question, the structure of the election center system has no impact on election outcomes, you would answer true or false? False, you would answer false, okay? The way the ballot is structured has an impact on election outcomes. True, true or false? True. Okay. Um, so the final tally in 2008 is 1766 for President Obama to 1639 for Hillary Clinton. Okay. That's really close. The super delegates, okay, the Democratic Party has something called super delegates who are elected officials and party leaders, and they try to unprevent, undermine the principles of party platforms to outsiders from coming in, um, and they give the illusion of greater unity, so that the final vote ends up being 22, 2230 to 1897, which looks like a bigger margin, right? In 2016, uh, uh, we have Clinton and Sanders. Clinton gets 2205 to 1846, so that's, that's just in regular you know, before there are super delegates, because there's a lot of outcry <laughs> by Sanders supporters that the super delegates were the reason why Hillary Clinton was winning. That's not the case, right? She won by as many there as Obama won with super delegates in 2008. Okay, uh, and then with super delegates, it looks even bigger, like a thousand bigger. Okay, a thousand bigger. Uh, in 2020, Biden and Sanders. 2700 to 1100, an even larger mark. Republican primaries are a little bit different. Uh, for one thing, uh, they award delegates sometimes at conventions. So they'll see those um, dark greens. No, sorry, those grays. See those grays? One, two, three. And there's a fourth one hidden somewhere. Maybe not. Those three grays. That means that you, if you are an active member of the Republican Party, you go to the state convention and you vote for who you want the nominee to be. How many of you have ever been to a state convention party convention? Raise your hand. One. How many of you have a parent who's ever been to a state party convention? Again, zero. How many of you have an uncle or grandparent or some relative that's been to a state party convention? Okay, so it looks like you guys are not particularly well represented at conventions. Right? I mean, no one, do you know somebody who's been to a state party convention? Anyone? One. One person. Two. Okay, one person. You guys are not particularly well represented at these conventions. So that's how that's decided. Um, states make the rules again. Um, and if we look at these, there's some that are winner take all. And so those are the dark green ones. So for example, if you get 30% of the vote in Florida and everybody else gets like 28 and 25 and 22 and eight, you win all the delegates in Florida. Think about that. That's not nothing, right? Um, the final tally in 2008, we have Romney versus all others, uh, 1563 to 583, right? Romney's in a pretty decent size field. There's about six, I think, and wins it pretty convincingly. Uh, the final tally in 2016, uh, Trump, President Trump gets 2472, all others get 2428. A much bigger field, but certainly not the kind of win that is decisive. In 2020, on the other hand, uh, 2358 to well one, right? That is more decisive. But it matters which party is running the primary. I was there less in 2020. What? I was there less in 2020. They just changed the. Oh. the rules and so they made it so there were less delegates 
because parties can do that. But you'll notice all these numbers are different. I mean, this yeah. is 2,000, that's 5,000. This is back to 2,400. Hmm. They just, they change the rules constantly about how many delegates come from each state. Um, issues with the electoral college. What is the electoral college? Yes. It's where electors vote for the president, right? And so how is the electoral college set up? How many votes does any state have? What's the calculation? It's the amount of representation they have in the uh, House and Senate. Okay, it's the amount of representation they have in the House and Senate. So it's easy to remember. Okay, so Oklahoma has how many congressional districts? Can you tell me? Five, that's right. And how many senators? Which equals seven electoral votes. Easy, right? Um, California has how many? 55, very good. And how many senators? Two. Two, two right? So 57, right? Um, how many does Wyoming have? One congressional district plus two senators equals three, right? So when we talk about this, that's the way the electoral college is set. One of the things we know is this. There are states that are more competitive than other states. There are states that are more competitive than other states. And so when we talk about competing for those votes, we have people who don't even come to Oklahoma and Texas or Kansas or Missouri or Arkansas or Louisiana or Mississippi. Why not? There's plenty of votes. There's lots of these are places where there's not a lot of votes either because people are there. What? It's a safe seat for one side or the other. There is no point in me as a Republican president, presidential candidate, in coming to the state of Oklahoma. Why? Because that's a waste of my money. Because people are going to vote for me no matter what. Trump came twice, didn't he? Trump came twice, but in an off election time. Uh, they came once uh, Did Biden for a come? private event. Oh, yeah. Did yeah. Biden come? What? Did Biden ever come? Biden only came during the primaries. And that's why I say during the primaries, you see a lot more, right? There's also no reason for a Democrat to come, right? I'm not saying that. But I'm just saying that whichever party is a safe seat for, they really don't have to come. Biden showed up a lot more in Texas, for example, than Trump did. In Georgia, the same, right? And a lot of that has to do with the nature of politics in Texas. What's the nature of politics in Texas? What's going on in Texas? Why go to Texas and not Oklahoma, other than the number of electoral? I got a whole list. Yeah, we're turning more blue. They're turning more blue, they're turning purpley, right? And so, and that's because of demographic change, um, but it's also just the number of people that are moving into Texas um, that are, you know, younger because there's industry there. Austin. And so demographics obviously are youth, but it's also ethnicity, yep. I was gonna say Austin, little California. Um, Austin is weird, right? So well, people call it little California. Eric's gonna call it little California. Oh, that's what I mean. Eric's never been in North Austin. Okay. All um, right. So um, when we talk about this, when we talk about where people are and how people show up, remember this also means that if you're in the Pacific Northwest or look, look at the North generally. I mean, you never see a presidential candidate, right? You're expected to fall in line to whatever your party is. It's going to distort the political campaign. It's going to accentuate the big short. Remember the big short? Sort of. So next week we have national elections for 2022. How many of you have registered to vote? Raise your hand. How many of you have already filled out an absentee ballot? How many of you already uh, early voted? In Oklahoma, you can't early vote until Wednesday. On Wednesday, I'll remind you to start early voting. Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, 
Saturday, maybe it's either Saturday or Monday, and then Tuesday. Okay, regular. Uh, lines are long, don't be discouraged. Uh, the congressional elections are the first Tuesday after the first Monday in November every two years. And every one of those other years, we have presidential elections that suck all the air out of it, right? That's all we care about. Um, but that means that today is October 31st, tomorrow is November 1st. That we cannot have an election on the first Tuesday of November unless <coughs> it's the first Tuesday after the first Monday. Why do you ask? These are interesting questions. Why do we even vote on the Tuesday? Unclear, right? So, um, well, actually, there's a reason. Do you guys want to know? Okay. So, historically, farm. here's the thing farmers came in for church on Sunday, had market day on Monday, stuck around and voted on Tuesday, and then went back to the farm. That's why. That's why we vote on Tuesday. Okay. How many of you feel like that way? Anyone? Anyone? Oh, that's weird. Okay. I'll go to the grocery so, store next Monday. What? I'll go to the grocery store next Monday. Okay, Eric's going to the grocery store to be part of the early life. Which is good. Okay. Tradition. All right. So, um, <laughs> midterm congressional elections are different than presidential election year. There's less media attention. There's lower voter turnout. Even more ideologically skewed. Right. More people who are farther to the right, or farther to the left, show up than they do in presidential elections because people don't pay attention unless the media tells them to pay attention. And so they don't think it's important. But the truth is, is at the state level, local level, you know, your member of Congress is going to be much closer to you and is responsible to answer to you, whereas the president is not. And so this is a much more important election than is a presidential. Presidential party almost always loses seats. So is it likely that the Democrats will lose seats? Yes. Yes. It's very likely. And so we need to look at that. And I'm going to hopefully get to the midterm predictions for you. I might wait till next Tuesday and do it on the day. We'll see. See what happens. Okay. I ain't coming on Tuesday. <laughs> so campaigns are highly structured. They're like business. They try to get the most gain out of limited resources. Thus, you don't go to Oklahoma or Kansas if you're a president, right? Um, and so if we're talking about what we're trying to get out of it, it means too. How many of you have been to your parents' house in the last month? Anyone? Okay. How many of you have looked at the mail that's stacked up? Okay, what's in the mail? House. Newspapers. What did, what else do we see? Anyone? Yeah. Okay, college junk mail. All right. Political flyers, right? I got so, I got one that was this size last week. Yeah, we were gigantic. That's a waste of money, right? Um, I'll tell you, just so you guys know, when you decide to run for office, are you ready? This is the best way to get votes. No, no. Go door to door. If somebody meets you, they're more likely to vote for you. Because you are not a name. You are not somebody who somebody has said bad things about. You're somebody who actually talked to them and shook your hand. If you want to win, go door to door, especially in congressional elections. Yeah. So does it matter if it's like one of your staffers doing it versus you? Um, it does a bit, right? Um, so having people get out the boat and go knock doors for you, that's great, but they should be able to point to you down the street, even if even if you don't get to meet, right? The thing is, you should probably knock every door if you can, right? Okay, so uh, how many of you are interested in ever working on a campaign or volunteering for a campaign or think you might be interested in that? One, two, three, three, and Eric. Okay, so um, if you ever are interested in working on a campaign, go volunteer. Go volunteer right now. They'll happily take your help from the last week, right? They want people to get out the vote, make sure, get out the vote, and get people who are registered to go vote, okay? 
Um, and so they want people to drive, people to do polls and things like that. I think both the staff of the same thing be more paid staff, but the reliance on volunteers never disappears. So let me tell you a little story, ready? I had last spring a fantastic undergraduate assistant. Hopefully this spring I'll get to hire another one. So you can apply that. But last spring I had a fantastic undergraduate assistant. His name is Seton Harazda. Remember him Seton? He's mayor Seton. He's the mayor of Silver, right? Okay, but he had the time to be my undergraduate assistant until he got a job. He was volunteering in the Langford campaign, and they wanted him to spend a little bit more time, so they were kind of paying him part time. And so he's like, So, with school and my mayoral duties, I can't really do this job. I sent this really nice letter, by the way. Oh, nice. And I said, See, I did it. Go do your things. This is what you want to do. You know, so my file has clearly. So not all well, and also I don't answer my emails well. It's not my fault. Right? So um, Seaton is now running the Langford campaign as the campaign manager or the field manager in the state of Oklahoma for a senator. And in April, he was working part time with the volunteer. What I'm saying is, go volunteer. They'll eventually run out of people who are burnt out and uh, they'll hire you. Okay. So, and this is something you want to get to. It's structured like a business, but it's treated like a sport, and the object is to win. Okay. And we've talked about this with tribes this idea that we belong and we have loyalty to places. We see the same thing here. This is something that campaigns play off of. How can we win? We want to win. The object is to win. And this is structured in such a way, like I said, structured like a business. You have this chain of command and all of those things. But the tactics employed are increasingly aggressive. And the point is to undermine the other candidate and to win. Is the point to inform the population about your issue standards? The answer is no. The point is to win. Okay, and so we see a lot of negative ads. How many of you guys like negative ads? No, nobody likes negative ads. Eric kind of um, funny. Here's the deal negative ads work, right? They're really effective. See, everybody says they don't like them, but they work. So, who is the most likely to be who is the most likely to be persuaded to change your vote? In this classroom, are you guys more likely to be persuaded to change your vote than is uh, than are your grandparents? What do you think? Absolutely. Why? Okay, they're locked into their way of thinking. That's one. You're absolutely right. What else? Remember that thing about. Um, once you vote for somebody, you're more likely to vote for them again. That matters, right? Well, I've always been a Dallas Cowboys fan, so <laughs> I guess I'm still a Dallas Cowboys fan, right? You're more likely to do that. It's the same thing. Think about it as sports because that's the way it's treated, okay? And it's treated that way in people's minds. I want you guys to be more open. Right? I want you to actually look at these issues. I want that to happen. But I also know that you're more likely to be persuaded to change the vote because you've never voted before or you voted one time. Okay. Um, where's the most efficient use of television advertising? Any guesses? Negative ads. Very good. Anything else? In primaries, it's really efficient. Um, to use the cable news networks that your party is most likely to watch. So you see a lot of Republican ads on Fox during primary season. 
We see a lot of Democrat ads on MSNBC during primary season. Okay. Other things that you might, where I would focus right now, if I were in this governor race or the superintendent race, for example, is all those early morning shows where you're going to see a lot of women watching television in the morning, in particular, after they get their kids to school, and then they have a minute, right? Um, I would love that. Another place. Where else is the efficient use of? Of uh, television advertising. <laughs> what? The evening news, absolutely. Because you're going to get a broad spectrum. The problem is it's not very targeted. Um, the economic missions favor the candidate, they focus on that. If they don't, they favor something else. Um, parties also tend to own some issues. For example, if I were to say education, which party owns education? Which party owns education? If you're voting for education, who do you vote for? I heard you now stand up. You're going to vote for Democrats. Democrats own it, right? Which party uh, owns? Do you think it's changed though? No, I don't. That's not what that's not what the voters show, right? But when we talk about things like the military, who owns that? Republicans own the military, right? Who owns the economy? You know, it's kind of mixed, right? It's kind of mixed. But uh, Republicans have tended to. Okay. What about gun ownership? Who owns it? Okay. Gun regulation. Okay. Parties own different things. There's lots of different strategies to get out the vote. I've gotten like 17 text messages telling me to go vote, um, and that's important. Direct contact campaigns are going to focus on mobilizing new voters. You're going to get text messages, things like that. And the result is, Certain people, however, are mobilized at higher rates than others, and those are typically people who have voted before. People who have voted before. <laughs> so I'm going to start here. Um, next week, and I'm going to talk about at the same time on Monday, the day before <laughs> the midterms. Uh, Eric's going to take attendance right now. Um, the day before the midterms, I'm going to do my real term predictions. So Eric is taking attendance. So